You know, I have to confess, I have always assumed that uh, our thoughts are constrained by the limitations of, of the language that we use. Uh, for example, I'm very interested in consciousness, and it's always struck me that people who use uh, languages like uh, Sanskrit have, have a much richer uh, texture in which to look at the various nuances of consciousness. And I know that you take a, a different point of view, I think, about language. Yeah, I don't think we, that we think in, in language or think in words. I think we think in visual images, we think in auditory images, we think in abstract propositions of what is true about what. Uh, and I think that a language is a way of communicating thoughts, of getting them out of one head and into another by making noise. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, even if you look at language itself, you see that there's got to be something underlying the words themselves, because words can be ambiguous. So if you take one of those uh, unintentionally uh, ambiguous newspaper headlines, like uh, Stud Tires Out, which was uh, in a New Hampshire uh, newspaper when they banned stud tires, but most people give it a different interpretation. Yes. The fact that there can be two ideas underlying the word stud, for example, or underlying the word tires, shows that words and thoughts can't be the same thing. Well, isn't it considered pretty much of a truism for people that, that different cultures have more words for some things that are important to them? I mean, we, we talk about the Eskimos, for example, having many words for snow. Right, and even that is really a bit exaggerated. Mm -hmm. There is a famous essay called The Great Eskimo Vocabulary Hoax, where someone actually went to a dictionary of the Eskimo language and counted the number of words for snow. And the first dictionary they picked up had the following number of words for snow. Not 400, not 200, not 100, two. Uh, now, that was a pretty stingy dictionary, and if you go to slightly bigger ones, you can come up with maybe a dozen, maybe 20. But if you think about it, English has a lot of words for snow, too. We've got avalanche and blizzard and hard pack and powder and sleet and slush, and we're not really that far behind the Eskimos. Now, this isn't to d deny the point that if mm -hmm. you're an expert in something, you're going to have more jargon words mm -hmm. for it. But I don't think it's that you have all these jargon words and you think more thoughts mm -hmm. or more finely mm -hmm. discriminating thoughts. Yes. I think if you uh, know a lot about something, you invent the words to uh, express mm -hmm. them. And I think the fact that we invent slang, we invent jargon, we invent new figures of speech when we need to, show that we have the idea mm -hmm. first, and we think to ourselves, how am I going to clothe this in words so I can mm -hmm make it clear to some other person. Well, language, of, of course, is more than just words. A language has a cadence, it has certain sounds and pitches and timbers. Don't you think these things may, may affect the environment in which we think? Well, th those are certainly what make for great literature and poetry and prose. And uh, artists and writers take advantage of those things to get across a certain emotional effect. And I, that's why great poetry and great literature is often very hard to translate, because even if you translate the meaning, you're not getting the, uh, the resonances of the sounds. You might have like a harsh staccato set of sounds in one language, and their exact translation might be something very mellow and smooth, and so you might lose that extra layer of meaning that resonates with the literal meaning. But the fact that you can translate it all, when you think about it, shows that there's got to be something other than words, because what would it mean for two sentences in, in different languages to be translations of each other, if not for the fact that both of them have the same meaning, where the meaning isn't exactly the same as either string of words. Mm -hmm. When we translate, we, it's obviously not like one of those phrase books where it's, how do I get to the train station, and then you find the equivalent in Hungarian. Because w if you know two languages, you can translate an unlimited number of sentences. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something, I think, under, underneath it. Something like um, a set of propositions that don't really have sounds that don't have any left to right linear order mm -hmm. the way language does, but that is a, a set of we a web of connections between concepts mm -hmm. and that are also connected with other aspects of experience mm -hmm. with visual images, with body sensations. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if we were to follow that line of thinking, it, it would seem to me that one might say that a person who has no language at all could still think, could still have thoughts. And I think that's true. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, Recently, uh, there have been a number of techniques that scientists have used to try to tap the minds of creatures that don't have language. We now know that uh, babies, for example, before they begin to talk, have a, a fairly sophisticated uh, understanding of the world around them. They pay attention to objects. They make 
predictions about how objects will behave, what will fall, what won't fall, what can pass through, uh, what, how people behave. Uh, babies clearly are making sense of the world, and that's before they're, uh, they're saying a word. Animals, too, I think there's a lot of good evidence that many uh, non-human animals engage in some form of thought, even though obviously they don't have the words. And even people with words, uh, if you look at the autobiographies of great scientists and, and authors and poets and sculptors, one thing that runs through all of them is that they say that their moments of inspiration often come from a, a vivid visual image, and that they then have to struggle to find the words to express that image. Not only in the sciences, like Einstein, who, who claimed to have uh, come up upon his insight about relativity theory by, say, imagining what it would be like to be in a plummeting elevator and then to take a coin out of your pocket and try to drop it. Mm -hmm. uh, often novelists uh, will say that the first thi idea for a novel will be a, a, a scene with people uh, in the scene, and then they struggle for the words to express it. Yes. So I think that aspect of experience jibes with what the science of mind has recently found out, mm -hmm. namely that language is a very rich part of the mind, but only one part. Mm -hmm.